and gentlemen, uh, can you all hear me at the back? No? I'm just fine then. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Is that better? Yes. Fantastic. Thank you for such an excellent attendance tonight. Um, my name is John Scarlett and I'll be the independent chair for this evening's session. Um, just to ensure that we're all here for the review of intermediate care uh, provision in Tameside and Glossop. Um, as I say, I'm, I'm independent. I'm the chair of Health Watch Oldham, and I'm also the lead governor of the Penine Care NHS Trust. Um, as I am outside the area, uh, I was asked to chair this as an independent person. Uh, so thank you for asking me to do that. Um, just to do some housekeeping initially, um, we're not expecting the fire alarm test, so if the fire alarm does go off this evening, then please follow the, the fire exits uh, you can see around the room. Um, it won't be a test, it will be the actual real thing. Um, we have uh, an agenda this evening, uh, which hopefully you've got a copy of there. Uh, I'll introduce the, the panel in, in a short time. Um, the, it is crucial for the meeting to be effective that we adhere to the ground rules that have been set for the meeting. Um, if I can ask you to turn any mobile phones onto silent, it is possible. Uh, so we're not interrupted there. If you need to use the toilet facilities, they're out uh, at the front there. And if you need disabled access to the toilets, one of the staff members outside will assist you. So the meeting tonight will finish at 8 o'clock prompt. Uh, the meeting will be videoed um, and we'll have audio on that as well. And that will be placed on the CCG website to enable people who aren't able to attend this evening to uh, listen to the questions and the answers that are given. Question from the audience then. Eight thirty isn't it? Really from that? Can you join us as eight thirty? Thirty. If necessary, we can go on to eight thirty. Um, it says eight thirty. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Six eleven. <laughs> Uh, there are seats at the front of the, the hall here, so those people at the back, if, if you'd like to sit down, there are plenty of seats at the front if you need to. Um, you, sh you should all have registered your, your name and contact details on the reception desk. Um, and when you ask questions at the uh, in question time, I'd appreciate if you could state who you are and whether you represent any organisation. I uh, just saw the panel and the, and the rest of the attendees are, are aware of that. Um, can I ask at all times, these are key things, that we are respectful of other people while they're talking, that they, we allow people to express either their opinion or their question uh, without interruptions, uh, that we are all very civil, we try and, well, we don't use offensive language, and um, if we could stick to critiquing the actual ideas and the discussions rather than critiquing the individuals who are making the point. Uh, anyone who doesn't follow those rules will be asked to leave the meeting this evening um, and similarly if the meeting becomes unmanageable then the meeting will have to be closed um, if, it, uh, if it just gets too hard to time. Um, if you could ask questions from your seat, we have a roving microphone now, we'll have to do it in a way that's per sector of the room, because it's such a large room. So, I propose that we do it per, per sort of quarter of the room, uh, once we get to question time, to allow the mic to, to move more efficiently around the room. Please keep your question concise, and keep your question to, to one question per person. We have so many people here tonight, that it's important that we, we let as many people as possible have their say. The chair, that's me, will be asking for questions from the floor and I'll also be supported by John Phillips and John is a, is a lead governor from uh, Tapeside um, NHS Trust who's kindly agreed to help this evening. Okay, then the, the main housekeeping points. Uh, I'll now introduce the panel. On the panel this evening we have Jessica Williams, Karen James, <coughs> Dr. Alan Dow um, and as they uh, introduce themselves, I'll ask them to, to say a bit about themselves and, and what they do as well. 
So I'll now hand you over to, to Jessica Williams. Thank you, John. Can you hear me? Does that, does that work? <coughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Don't think I can do this standing on tiptoes, but um, do let me know if my voice so Just go like that and I'll try and speak up, okay? Um, so yes, as John said, already? Yeah. Right, okay. Um, uh, my name is... Just closer, any better? You can see I'm not used to doing this. Is that better? Does that, does that work? Okay, good. We're nodding. So, um, my name is Jessica Williams and I'm the Care Together Programme Director, which is the name of the programme we have for health and social care integration across Tameside and Blossom. But also, about six weeks ago, I've taken on the role of being the Interim Director of Commissioning for Tameside and Glossop. And what that means is that um, I'm the responsible director for purchasing services on behalf of, well, purchasing health services on behalf of all of the residents of Tameside and Glossop. So, approximately 240,000 people. So that's uh, my name and my role, and I'm just going to do one very quick slide now before I hand on to Karen, who will then be followed by Alan, who will both introduce themselves as well. Um, but I wanted to just say something about the Care Together programme. The Care Together programme has been going for about three, three and a half years, and it is all focused on how we do a number of things. The main one being driving up healthy life expectancy in Tameside and Glossop. It is unfortunate, but it is a fact that in the Greater Manchester, and for the purposes of health, that includes the Glossop residents, um, our, our healthy life expectancy is significantly below the England average. And for Tameside and Glossop, we're significantly below the Greater Manchester. So the whole programme that we're trying to deliver under the Care Together name and the banner is all about driving up healthy life expectancy. And that means basically keeping people independent and well and healthy and able to access services um, and uh, a good high quality of services across health and social care um, and that we keep everybody living as independently and as uh, a varied and a busier life as what everybody would like to do. So we also have a couple of other priorities in terms of we also want to improve patient experience, we also want to improve our financial sustainability and it is a fact of life that we have a major financial challenge. Um, that's not just in Tameside and Glossop, it's across the whole of, um, well arguably the United Kingdom but particularly in England. Um, and also we want to drive up the quality of all of our services. So that's a little bit about the Care Together programme. We've done a huge amount of engagement in various different groups over the last three years and trying to get some understanding um, about what people want in their local areas and what their most important priorities are. This is the first one of the formal consultations we've had about services, so intermediate care, and we are consulting on intermediate care. And the second one went live yesterday, or actually it was this morning, which is around urgent care, and should anybody have any questions about that specifically, I can pick those up later on in the presentation as well. So um, just to stress that the key stakeholders within this, these wires, are going to be a nightmare. I can see myself going face down in a minute. But anyway, so uh, the key stakeholders for this um, Care Together programme are Tameside Metropolitan Borough Council, NHS Tameside and Glossop Clinical Commissioning Group, so the CCG, and also Tameside and Glossop Integrated Care NHS Foundation Trust, which used to be known as Tameside Hospitals Foundation Trust. We also work extremely closely with Derbyshire County Council, with the High Peak Borough Council, with a vast array of um, voluntary sector groups, both in Glossop and in um, Tameside, but the statutory organisations that mainly contribute to the programme are those three on the board. So that just gives you a little bit of context about Care Together, and I will now hand over to my colleague, Karen. Okay, 
Uh, as you can see um, from the slide here, my name is Karen James and I'm the Chief Executive at Tameside Blossom Integrated Care Organisation, which, as Jess says, was formerly known as Tameside Hospital. Um, what I want to do is uh, to put things into context, really, uh, before Alan talks about intermediate care beds. Because, as Jess has said, the Care Together programme is much more than uh, what we're consulting on today with respect to the provision of intermediate care beds. It's much more than that. And what I want to do is tell you a little bit about that, what else we're doing uh, to support this programme. Um, before I do that, this follows on uh, from an engagement process that's been taking place over the last three years. So we have been engaging with our communities to see what's important to you. And that's been really key in terms of looking at how we develop new services going forward. So what you said to us was you wanted to stay healthier and independent for as long as possible. Uh, you wanted greater integration of services because at the moment uh, you're, you're experience, if you've experienced services with both the hospital community, often they're fragmented. Uh, we want a single point of access because it's very difficult to navigate yourself or your a family member around the services that are available. Uh, so they wanted greater integration. And therefore we were looking at a single point of access. And they wanted, you were also told us you wanted care to be delivered at home where possible. So what we have been doing over the last three years is trying to design services to allow that to happen, to meet those objectives. So, what we have been doing is working with our neighbourhood teams. So, that the neighbourhood teams comprise of uh, GPs uh, within certain neighbourhoods, and you've got a neighbourhood team here in Blossom. And what we're trying to do is support uh, our colleagues within the integrated hubs by making sure we all work collectively together. So, what we're doing, trying to do, is co locate services around those neighbourhoods. So not just in primary care, but we're trying to ensure that we dovetail all of the services such as district nurses, physios, social care, the third sector, the voluntary sector, so that we can actually deliver services in a much more integrated way and there'll be a single point of access. We've also been developing new services so we can actually uh, deliver more within the community and that's really key. So I won't go through all of these new services, but digital health, for example, we put digital health in our nursing homes and uh, we've got opportunities to put digital health in people's homes as well to actually monitor and provide specialist input so patients or their carers do not have to actually access hospital services all the time. We can keep people at home where they want to be. We've developed, we've developed IV community uh, services so therefore patients used to have to come in for IV therapy into the hospital environment, they don't any longer. Uh, we have access over seven days to provide that support in their own home. We've got home first, so if we can avoid anybody having to come into hospital, so it's not a great place to be unless you're really acutely ill, we will do so. So often we wrap services around, if somebody's got an urgent care need, we try and wrap services around that patient uh, within their own home for a period of time to make sure that we actually can assess what their care needs are going forward. And the same with regards to ensuring that we discharge patients earlier from hospital. Again, we can do so and wrap services around uh, the patient, uh, again, within their own home to prevent uh, delays in discharges. And we've got an extensive care service where we have got GPs who are looking at those patients who are at high risk of actually accessing uh, hospital services and to try and work with them more proactively to prevent uh, the patient's uh, health uh, deterioration. So those are just some of the new models that are put in place now. So I've just tried to set the context because tonight we're just going to be talking about one element of our uh, Care Together programme, and that is about intermediate care beds. So often when we, you can't really stay at home, your needs uh, uh, mean that you need greater support, then you can access an intermediate care facility. 
and we have a number of intermediate care beds within Tameside and Blossom, and that's what we want to talk to you about tonight. So I hope I've been able to put into context what we are doing to achieve the objectives you set out for us. But I'm going to hand you over to Alan, Dr. Alan down there to talk to you about intermediate care and intermediate care beds. <coughs> Thank you. So, I'm Dr. Alan Bell, I'm a GP, into this area in about 1988, started general practice here in about 1995, and shortly after that got in the commissioning, interested in the commissioning of health services, seeing what was working, what wasn't working, where the blocks and jams were, and actually have been involved in commissioning ever since. Um, in 2012, there was a health and social care act that changed health administration into clinical commissioning groups um, and I'm the chair of the clinical commissioning group and in partnership clinical commissioning group and TNPC chair of the single commission with them. So as Carolyn said, Care Together is a much wider program. <laughs> Carry on. If it was a fire alarm, it's still be going. <laughs> so Care Together is a much bigger program, um, and really going back to when you know, the, the, the hospital is in a difficult place, as many of us with, with fairly long memories or even short memories will know, and the transformation that's gone forward was part of a package to see things being different, seeing not just that we had an acute old model district general hospital on our patch, but actually we had a much more community focused organization. It became reborn as the first integrated care organization, FT, in England actually, and it's much more reaching out into the community, um, as Cameron said. But drilling down just into that one small part of care together, and intermediate care and intermediate care beds. So intermediate care, when you are in between not being ill enough anymore to need the provision of a, of a hospital, but actually not well enough to be in your own home or care setting without extra help. And there's two ways of delivering that. One is to increase the provision of care around you at home. And as Karen said, we can now do some things that we didn't do before. We can bring intravenous therapy, intravenous antibiotics, some remote monitoring of you. So a lot of things that we can do even a few years ago. But the other thing we can do is in between hospital and home, you go into an intermediate care bed. Now there are two ways of getting into beds. Um, sometimes, and certainly in the past, when people were at home, instead of them going into hospital, we could upgrade their care and they went into a bed. And that happens still some of the time. The vast majority of the time, people are coming out of hospital, not well enough to go straight home, needing a period of enablement, and that's what we use these beds for. Not all of us, but most of the time. Now, whenever we can, we clearly look after people in their own bed. That's clearly going to be the first choice. But it isn't always possible. We have a specialist team of people, of nurses, of physios, of OTs, that provide that enablement to get people well enough, as quickly as possible, to be out of these intermediate care bed placements and back into their own home. And this, this this triangle pretty well illustrates from our five neighbourhoods where we'll be doing what we can to look after people in their own home and be stepping up that provision of care into the yellow zone, which is actually where these beds in the community are, halfway in between hospital and home. And then right at the top, and it is worth remembering that at the top of the pyramid, those people who need hospital admissions is the very small part of it. And as Karen has said, you only want to be in there for as long as you need to be in there. 
And certainly older people, older people with memory problems, with mental problems, in a setting like that will deteriorate very quickly. And hence we need a specialist provision of beds to get people back to able to um, go into their own homes. So there's two arrows in the diagram, step up and step down. That was what I said before. You could step up into one of these beds from your home setting. Mostly, though, we step down onto them. Now, over the duration of the Care Together program, and we've had, we've had a few discussions over the years on that, there are undoubtedly a few things that people have said in the neighbourhood of Glossop and other neighbourhoods as well. Um, using the primary care centre that we have in Glossop, which is a beautiful asset, is undoubtedly our direction of travel and commitment. You said keep care as close to home as possible. And as I'm saying, we've, we've now got a crucial building block in that. We've no longer got something that is just an acute bed provider, but is actually back to being a bed provider, a community nursing provider, and in the full direction of travel, picking up um, an extended range of community and neighborhood activities. You said we should use these beds to avoid people going to hospital where we come. And I think as we go forwards, we're looking at um, a population that's aging, as we all know, that is getting more medical <coughs> problems as age advances. And therefore, even although technology advances and we can do still more things and look after people in their own homes, there is going to be a need for still bed-based intermediate care. and supporting people leaving independent lives, not forgetting that people have mental health needs as well as physical needs. I know that one of the things that we've talked about in some of the other consultations is about how people get better quicker with friends and family around them. And I'm sure that that's part of what the, the questions will be, because clearly we have a provision that is in Glossop. So we more about that then. The consultation is about the provision of these bed-based services. It's not about other things just now, that's what it's about. We have three options. We've been candid, we've said we've got a preferred option. The first option is leaving things as they were, the same as they were last year, the same as they were the year before. At the moment, our beds are split almost 50-50 between um, beds in Shire Hill Hospital in Glossop and beds in the Stamford unit which is within the hospital footprint in Thameside. Option one would be leaving things unchanged. Option two, and we've said that this is our favoured um, proposal, is putting all of the beds together in the one place where the majority of people, nearly everybody, is entering the beds on coming out of Thameside Hospital. It's on the same footprint, it's right next door. Option three, and certainly um, an option that has been discussed at the first Glossop meeting and in some of the smaller meetings we've had, is actually maybe they don't need to be in a special all-in-one place. Maybe we can stimulate the market to say that the care homes and nursing homes could actually look after people and enable them. And that would allow for a provision of, home, of beds across Glossop and the other neighbourhoods. And certainly there has been a proposal or a variation on that then. And that could happen in Glossop. Does it happen to happen everywhere? It certainly has a lot to recommend it, as is the first one. I really think that you know the care bed provision has been helpful to us. We previously had intermediate care beds in that setting. They all have their strengths. Some of them have their weaknesses. That's the current situation just now. In the 36 beds at Shire Hill, two are not in use at the moment, so the true picture is there's 32 at the Stanford Unit, 34 in Shire Hill. Option one leaving that the same, option two them all going to the Stanford Unit. Option three would be in 32 as is in the Stanford Unit, but up to 32 scattered around the neighbourhoods, or thinking specifically about the Glossop neighbourhood. Um, as Jess alluded to, it's not all about money, but it's also not true that it's not about money at all. And the financial calculation for the preferred options is paid for 
and we release 686 million, uh, sorry, thousand million would be good, a year, uh, which is certainly not a significant sum of money. It's a money that if it's spent there can't be spent elsewhere, but as has been raised before, in the consequence of a total health and social care budget um, that's coming close to a billion pounds, and that's counting TMBC's budget, not Derbyshire's. It wouldn't be a driver on its own to be doing things. The driver for this is in our vision statement as a clinical commissioning group, which is to improve the quality of clinical services. That's what it is. Uh, so that was the preferred option um, which, are, which are covered. Those that know anything about the Stamford unit, it is a new build unit, it is, um, it's got all of the benefits of a new build has, and it is a very state-of-the-art facility. I won't say too much about that. Um, other than some of the statistics around where we get to where we are. Now, People have said, they're just statistics, they're based on the real use of people in Shirehill and in other places, and their families and their carers. Um, and I think one of the big arguments is at the moment, our beds are split for the whole of the 250,000 people that we commissioned for as a CCG across two sites, 50-50 almost, one of them on the site being the east side of Glossop, the other being pretty well in the centre of the footprint. Now as much as we can, streaming services as we can, so that if you're a Glossop resident, maybe you would go to Shire Hill, not the other way around. But I think you can understand that doesn't always happen. But the majority of people, just by the numbers, using the Shire Hill site are of course not Glossop residents. They are coming from without, through within Thameside and Glossop. And some of them are coming diagonally opposite because that's the way we live in Tegis. Some of the figures about where you live within the area and round about, we all know it can be hard getting in and out of Glossop. I'm a Glossop resident, I know it's hard getting in and out of Glossop. At the moment, we're asking a lot of people for the population for Thameside and Glossop just to do that, to visit their loved ones at the Inshire Hospital. So if I hand back to Jessica. Last couple of slides and then we can get into the questions. And um, this is the bit that I always look forward to on any of these sorts of things because I get to present transport data. And before you all start groaning, um, because I know you're not going to like what I say, I'm very conscious that you're not going to like what I say about transport and distances, because as Alan has already said um, about uh, the difficulties and the many challenges that you all have getting in and out of Gossip. <coughs> we have based... Here we go. So, uh, Basically, what we're putting up here is about the transport data. And what I wanted to say about this is, it's less about the times and the amount of minutes it takes to get from A to B in terms of the time side. But all it's, this information is taken from a system called base, base Traffic. And it's a standard tool that the NHS uses to judge transport distances and about how it makes decisions, basically, and take transport into into consideration. Now I'm well aware that you won't like those statistics and that probably many of you it's not your own personal experience. But what I would like to say is that it is the same software we use for this that we used in the Healthier Together consultation which many of you will be aware of and it was absolutely the gloss up travelling times that affected that entire consultation for the whole of Greater Manchester and it was based on that same data. Also, and as I've referred to earlier, we have another consultation which has gone live today around urgent care and we've used the same data and it is for that reason that the Glossop enhanced, or rather the extended hours... Sorry, do you need me to speak up? No, uh, I'm going to have to go to Ms. Fairfield because just, you've replied to me with this and you put the stuff in the email and that is out of date. 
Okay. All right, can I just, I'll finish and then come, come back to you, because I've not got long to do. The other thing is that the urgent uh, care consultation, as I was saying, is, um, is based on the same data, or rather the base track data, and that is why in the urgent care consultation, the glossop services are being maintained at the current capacity, which is not the same for Tameside, and that is based on the transport. So logically, one has to have one system for analysing transport data. It's not perfect. It doesn't take into consideration roundabouts and hills and traffic lights and everything, but it does do average times over 24 hours, and that's how they measure it. It's a very standard tool. It doesn't necessarily play well in this audience, and I fully understand that, and I'm very happy to answer more questions about it, but it is the logical tool that we use, and I think it has absolutely played in favour for Gloucester residents and some of our other Derbyshire residents in terms of the healthy and together consultation and certainly in urgent care. So, final slide. It's just to reiterate, and I wanted to leave your website to dress up there for you, is that there is a preferred option. I think it would have been disingenuous to put anything else in there, to not do that. So we have been very clear that it is our preferred option and that's because we believe that the clinical outcomes will be maximised and will be better for our entire population if we go with option two. However, it is a consultation. We have had a huge amount of responses, which is brilliant. All of those will be analysed and we'll start doing that analysis when the consultation closes in a couple of weeks' time. And all of that will be pulled into a report alongside the financial considerations, legal considerations, clinical considerations, and um, the case for change, the equality impact assessment, uh, the quality impact, and looking at all of those things. And then there will be a meeting which is held in public. It's called our Strategic Commissioning Board. Um, and we'll be holding that in December. And ideally, we'll be making a decision at that point. So. It, I know people keep saying to me, oh, we've already decided. We have decided what our preferred option is, but we have a consultation process, and that is why we are here this evening, and why we're going through all of the, all of the options. So it runs until the 15th of November. That's our website address. Also, if you can, if you haven't responded yet, please do so. It would be very helpful. The more um, responses we get from across Thameside and Gossip, the better. Um, and I think I'll draw that to an end because I know that you want to get into the questions. Um, ideally, in a room this size, you would normally have some roving mics, so you're just going to have to bear with us because we only have this one. But if I pass back to the chair, and then we've got Joe and... Katie, do you want to come and split the room between you? And then we'll have to bring it back to us so that we can come <coughs> Okay, thank you, speakers. Um, thinking of questions now, if we deal with this quarter of the room first, the front quarter, and um, we'll pass the mic down there first. Okay, fair enough. If you were just going to ask when the new last chair, uh, the last version of the base track, what was that last updated? The base tracking from the system software you used. We pulled this off about two weeks before we went through the consultation. Okay, so we pulled this off about two weeks before we went through the consultation. So the information is about, the last time we updated this was about two weeks before we went live with the consultation. The mother was at 86, tried to get to hospital and cannot get there in less than an hour and a quarter. Can you say 40 minutes? I don't say, the base track system has been a Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sir John Oldham, I was a GP here for 27 years and then became National Clinical Lead for Long Term Conditions Department of Health. I currently advise 
here in the Royal Highland Commanding Integrated Care. First, I'd like to applaud what Thameside is doing on integrated care is phenomenal and we should thank them. Um, that is why it's difficult for me to say that this intermediate care bit I don't think got quite right. And <coughs> centralising stroke services is correct. Centralising intermediate care beds isn't. And you say uh, in much of the do documents that the play on having above average number of beds as though that's a badge of dishonour. My, uh, you're actually looking through the wrong end of the telescope. Yes. The, nationally, uh, people are trying to catch up to where we are. We started this in 1994, and you will require 22% more beds by 2030 than you have now, if a needs analysis is done. The community provision you're putting in place uh, will be um, okay, but I don't think it will deliver because it's slightly tame side centric and it's based on a medical model of care. For home first, you need home care first. The determinant of whether somebody goes into hospital or comes out quickly is the availability of home care. And whilst you'll be able to flex that with your single budget in Thameside, you won't hear in Derbyshire. And I know and I heard at the video reassurances that there is a very integrated service here in Gloucester between health and social care. From personal experience this year I can tell you, and I know you want that and I know you believe it, I genuinely know that, it's sophistry. And our history here is that every time services are transferred and centralised to Thameside, we end up as second class citizens. Yeah. Yeah. So here's my proposition, that you suspend this, you work intensively for a couple of months with people who actively work at the front line here in Glossop to create a bespoke integrated care team. What that really means when you've got a different local authority, and there are examples around the country, and the minute it doesn't, re doesn't do that, and you're including that, integrated in intermediate care beds. If you don't, I fear, and I don't say this in any sense, with any degree of pleasure, I, I think you have, unfortunately, a flawed analysis which will lead to a wrong decision. I think you can change it quite easily, but I would urge you to do that. A few of us on the panel wanted to answer terms for John. Um, um, one of the great things about the public consultations that we've had is that from the floor we've had some good challenges that we've had to think about, think whether we have considered them. Um, and this is one of the areas that I just did mention on passing. We are, as you will absolutely be aware, um, trying to do two are called differential calculations at the same time. We've got an aging population that has got more things wrong with them, that will continue to need probably more beds, which is the point that you make, being offset by us able to do things in the community that we couldn't do even five years ago or ten years ago. So my point was I agree we can't think that these intermediate care beds and the need of them are going to go away. We are well positioned nationally in having them, which is a point that you note. So we're in a good place for having them and we're not intending to reduce them. Okay, there, there is a reduction of, of the one, but we're not cutting them by 20% or anything like that. So the question is, if, and, and I think this is, we have heard that same question before, in from the floor at the last bottom um, meeting as well. If, there were, at the moment, um, poorly developed services on the ground. And we're still asking the question, and you need reablement in a bed? That's what this consultation is about. 
Does your reablement get better or change when we're talking about the banks because of what's on the ground? And I don't, I don't think it does. I think it comes back to some of the fairness that those people that need a bed, and we are commissioning for 250,000 of them, need a bed. Where's the best place for that bed to be? Is it next door to the one hospital that we have? We don't have five hospitals. We've got one hospital. But one hospital where nearly everybody is coming out of to go into those beds. And then we take half of them and we put them on the far eastern side of our circumference. The same as if we did with the site in Drawsden. And we said to Glossop, it's over in Drawsden. We're not saying that, and if we did say that, I'd be one of the first to say, that's not on, that is not fair. We're not saying that, we're saying, let's put it in the centre of the economy, where the people are coming out to, right next to the hospital where they're coming. At the bottom of one of the slides, what I, which I didn't say, and we have, we have said before, um, back to us actually. So, the fact is, when you are in an intermediate care setting, you're not out of the woods. You're not fully better. If you were fully better, you would be in your own home. Fact, 27% of those in the intermediate care beds in Shire Hill need remitted. <coughs> Nothing to do, somebody did say, so you're saying the staff isn't right or something like that. Not at all. It's because you're not 100% well. If you were, you wouldn't be in an intermediate care bed. If you're one of the 27 percent needing we admitted, you don't really want to be in Shanghai. It's not ideal to be at the far end of it. You want to be next to the hospital that you're being readmitted to. One of my own patients was readmitted twice. And sometimes it, it is an emergency admission. And sometimes, as Karen might tell her, actually being next door to the hospital that you've come out of with some of the continued services, you could put into the unit next to you. So we, we have we have heard that before. And the, and the last thing, you know, 30 30, absolutely, I'm not disagreeing that that's the trajectory, but with this level of 20 30, good point, 20 30, we're, we're, um, we're already in a good starting point. So if we keep going in the right direction, but we, we can't have a provision that for 20 30, that, that wouldn't make sense. Uh, thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Chris Webster, and I'm a uh, public governor for Glossopdale for the uh, Thameside and Glossop Foundation Trust uh, Hospital. Uh, I've been to two of the three of the meetings now. And I've heard everything that's been said. Uh, this exercise has not been a public consultation. A public consultation is an open and transparent consultation process that is required to attract maximum public engagement to engage the public sector equality duty has been complied with. This should be reflected in the equality impact assessment which decision makers must have due regard to before making any decision. By declaring option two as the preferred option, I firmly believe the public sector equality duty has not been met, and this could render any final decision open to a real challenge. This has been actually a paper exercise, making use of distorted statistics to justify a decision that's already been made based on financial forces rather than the well-being based on medical requirements and care of those most vulnerable residents of our community, namely the sick and the elderly. Yeah. It's been based on a decision to move 34 post-op and rehabilitation care beds, not intermediate care beds, as the doctor quite uh, clearly keeps on going on about, to move those from a well-run, well-staffed, dedicated facility into a luxury care home that was never, ever designed or constructed to house and care for such vulnerable people. If the system... <laughs> the 
If the CCG and the single commissioning body do continue to proceed with this exercise, I respectfully suggest they change their stance and actually listen to the concerns of the residents. I, so I also suggest they elect to go with option one, as already recommended by one of your stakeholders, namely High Peak Borough Council. Thank you. Two or three questions at once, then put them to the panel. Okay, yeah. any questions asked? Hello, my name is Ken Conkenny, and I'd like to follow on from Dr. Uh, Sir John Alden, if I may. Um, wherein is the Glossop in Tameside and Glossop Integrated Care Foundation Trust? As a community, Tameside offers Glossop very little in, com in comparison to the rest of Tameside. We were told we would have a walking centre when work commenced on George Street Clinic. That never happened. Promises are now being made to extend services at George Street, but nothing is in writing. It is therefore hard to believe these things will go ahead. As life expectancy increases the needs for more intermediate care beds, more intermediate care beds will also be needed. The Stamford unit is on lease to Tameside Hospital from LNM Health Care. Tameside does not own the building. What will happen if the company decides not to extend the lease? Tameside will have no intermediate care beds. To use rented buildings is short-sighted and only gives a short-term solution. At least keeping Shinehill open, we can guarantee 36 intermediate care places. Or are plans being made to privatise intermediate care? Shinehill <laughs> Hospital, at very little expense, could expand its services for the community. It has ample parking and ample space. Unlike the White Elephant that was built on George Street, it only runs at 20% capacity. Where to, rent, where to rent is too high and where there is nowhere to park. My question, what will happen when L&M do not renew their lease? Okay, so two, two questions there, panel. One about the consultation itself and one about the walking centre and the LM organisation there. Can I just talk a little bit about facilities? Obviously, I've spent quite a bit of time at Shire Hill. Uh, it's really not fit for purpose in terms of... Okay, in terms of the staff review, absolutely it is fit for purpose. It was built, it actually meets all the modern requirements for healthcare provision to go forward. So that's just facts. Okay. Can you explain the facts? Can you explain those facts if they are facts? Okay, so it built, in terms of um, providing healthcare services, you have to meet the certain regulations. Facilities now, you should have on suite facilities. That's the new building regulations. So the new standard unit complies with those regulations. So you can see the difference between you know, the two units. I just want to talk about uh, the lease with uh, L&M. I mean, if you look at the hospital, we don't own the hospital building either. It's a BFI. It's the same, it's a similar thing. So even at the hospital, we don't own those buildings. And it's not the NHS yeah. services. Yeah, we don't own the NHS. We own it. The public. So, in terms of the lease, yes, we decided we didn't want to take a long term lease. That was, that was on the table. Because we want break clauses, because we want to renegotiate what the requirements are going forward. So, that was our decision. And absolutely, we have a longer lease if we wish to do so. Uh, in terms of George Street, absolutely it is underutilised, 
but it's actually in the centre of Glossop, as you will know. What we want to do is actually move more services in there, which we are currently doing. So, uh, <laughs> I can also say that we are investing in Glossop, we're investing money from Greater Manchester into Glossop. So in terms of all the services I've talked about over the five neighbourhoods, those services that we are developing will be the same in all five neighbourhoods. There is no difference. So we are investing and we are investing money from Greater Manchester into Glossop. Um, so there will be no variation in service delivery with regards to the new services I've just discussed with regards to uh, Care Together. And I think that's all I want to do. Yes, so um, I said I'd been interested in commissioning for a few years and that's absolutely true so I was around when the Glossop Primary Care Centre was uh, commissioned and put there. Um, I heard for the first time that it had been offered as a walk-in centre at the High Peak Scrutiny. Um, I, hadn't, I hadn't heard that before at the leap but I'm being told somebody must have said that. It, it was never an intention that it could be run or staffed that there are people there the whole time that if you turn up, you can be seen. It is a, it is, a, yeah, and I'm not disagreeing, somebody must have said that at some point, but if you had asked me, that was never going to, that was never going to work. What is happening there now is that there are evening planned GP surgeries there during the week and at the weekend. And as Jess alluded to, um, Glossop being more out on the limb than the other sites, in the consultation for urgent care that is going ahead, the full provision of those services are, uh, uh, remain for Glossop, whereas they are up for consideration in the other sites across Thameson. Um, and just in relation to Chris's point about High Peak Borough Council as one of our stakeholders, so what they, they did go for option one, and Yay. we were there. And the reason they went for option one was to give us more time to think about things. And my point is, this is the time. It's been a 12-week consultation. Let's have the ideas of what would be better during the consultation. I think there are ways this could be better, this because it doesn't feel like a consultation to me. There are other ways of running things than us. Every every point someone in the audience makes, we have you have another three five minutes from the yeah. panel. That's yeah. not fair. It's not, not listening down. to us. Okay. Well, so what we could do is take a group of questions. Yeah. So if we take some more questions from this area. And we'll see, and then we'll pull some of those, and then we'll ask for hands if anybody wants to add on to that particular theme. Would that work? Because I do, I take your point. Um, we need to hear more from you than from us. Okay, yeah. but I just want to come back on Mr. Webster's point about the equality impact assessment. There is an equality impact assessment, and the whole purpose of the consultation is to up, up, upgrade that, basically. And we take all of the information, and we continue to work on that, and then it is updated and brought through. So we haven't ignored the equality impact assessment at all. But I think, John, if we take a whole, there's a whole bunch of people there and take a whole group of questions. Can I just ask that people keep their questions con as concise as possible so we get a chance to go across the whole room? Yeah. <coughs> we like them, sure. Just so we can see all the t-shirts on first. I've captured the people with the hands up, so I will come back to you. Thank you very much. I'm uh, assigned in as a councillor at Hatfield, but I'm speaking as a resident of Glossop. I'm not speaking for anybody but myself, okay? And I was a teacher for over 40 years before I retired. I used to, always used to introduce the boring subject of statistics when I was teaching maths with the line, there are lies, damn lies, and then there are statistics. And it always used to go down well, and all the, all, the, all the ones in the audience, which was the children of course, they, 
they didn't like it very much. It wasn't interesting until we got on to gambling, and then they worked out odds like no business. But it seems that all the statistics that are being presented here, they talk about Tameside and Glossop and percentages, and this is nonsense, because what we are here for is not Tameside and Glossop, we are here for Glossop. And the answer is... Let the people in Tameside go to Tameside and open some beds there, but leave the one in Shire Hill for the people in Glossop, because over the next 20 years, it's going to double the number of beds required in there because of the ages of the people in Glossop. So it's a nonsense. Hello, my name is Bob Callow, I'm a retired academic um, and I want to support the previous chap and the, the governor from the, the school. Um, I'm not talking about focus statistics here, I'm just conscious of the fact that the statistics are presented selectively. Yes. Yes. I'm very yes. conscious of that. So for example, when 27% of patients in Shire Hill were readmitted to their hospital. What is the equivalent figure for patients in intermediate care on the same side? Is it higher or is it lower? We have we are not being presented with all the information. Similarly, of course, if you have most of your provision for beds on the eastern end of the region, it follows automatically that you'll get higher proportions of people from outside the area in Shire Hill. That's just a function of the number of beds, the way they're being distributed. So the sensible thing to do is to have more beds in Thameside and either a smaller number or maintain the number. It depends on the money. But basically, we need the facility at Shire Hill. Thank you. Thank you, Bob McEwen. Um, I think Borough Council will represent that for you a lot. In the good old days, it was on the Community Health Council, the work for the health service since 1966, and I took part in many of these consultations, but the main fact I want to get over, for me since, since 2003, I've been a member of IP Borough Council Planning Committee, sometimes quite as popular as what Dr. Dow is in the panel tonight. <laughs> After quite a long debate, we had the planning application in the George Street Clinic. It went on quite a while. One of the only reasons they got planning permission for there, we were told by Tameside that we wanted to stop all necessary long journeys on Mr. Tameside. <laughs> I can't use the word I want to, it'll be very brief and there's a lot of people. We got sadly misled by the facilities, what they said would be in there, and that was the only reason it got planning permission. Can you ask me after that how anybody in this room can believe a single word we told tonight? <laughs> Um, if this is a money saving exercise, has it been considered that when the present present government comes out and a new party goes in, there will be much more funding to the health service, which is currently being underfunded? Hello, I'm Rebecca Gallagher, I'm a Furnace Fire Book here, uh, representing you. So could you just uh, give us a brief rundown of where the financial savings are actually made? Uh, and if any of them come through staff losses, well, that, I don't know if they don't, but would that have any impact if they don't? No, so what, where the, um, the financial savings are made? Thanks. We'll just pause there for now, because we've got five questions there. I'd like to ask the panel to, to address the questions. We've got a question about staffing. A question about a couple of questions about statistics. Um, would you like to just answer those yeah. questions? Then? Right. Okay. So let me deal with the really easy one first. The savings, financial savings, are entirely on the amount of rent Tameside and Glossop pay to NHS property services 
for that building. There is no suggestion or plan to save any money at all from staff costs. I can't see the units from there. This, right, okay. So just to make that absolutely clear. So that one's addressed. Um, on the one about more funding to the NHS with a new government. Uh, right, um, that would be nice. Um, and uh, we would obviously want to spend any extra money and investment that we get into the NHS or social care wisely. Alan did talk about earlier about how this is not financially driven, it is about an outcomes thing, although the finances do come into it. We do have an obligation to look after the public pound. Nobody wants taxpayers' money to be perceived as being wasted or not used as most efficiently as possible. This isn't the major driver behind this scheme. We have a £70 million problem in Thames Island Gossip. £70 million we have to find, and that's over the three key statutory, that doesn't include Derbyshire, I think they have their own financial issues. We have a major financial challenge. This is not, it, it's a tiny, tiny contribution towards that. It is not the major way we're looking for financial savings. We're doing the whole kind of transformation and trying to work out how we do the whole thing better, and that goes over the whole of the public sector reform. So. We're looking at roads, we're looking at education, we're looking at all sorts of ways that we can make our services as effective as possible. And should there be extra money that comes in at any point from any government in the future, then we will aim to spend those wisely and effectively as well and increase service provision where we have, where we, where we need to. The George Street to avoid long journeys. I can understand your frustration, it must be really frustrating and very irritating. However, it's, I can't, you know, I'm obviously stand here as a, as a representative of, of Thameside and Gossip and the management team, so I'll take my fair responsibility on that. I can honestly tell you now, and I'm, not, I'm sure most of you won't believe me, but I'm going to tell you anyway, that I have never, ever fronted a consultation which I do not believe in is absolutely the best thing about improving outcomes. And my job as the Director of Commissioning and the Programme Director is to think about how do we improve outcomes for all 240,000 people. And that is why I'm standing up here. You know, you may not, you, you may not know this, but actually standing in front of a room of this size it's not, it's, it's not the best experience ever, but I do it because, because it's really important, it's really important to be able to take, stand here and say that I honestly believe that this is the right way to drive up outcomes for all 240,000 people across Thames Island and that's what we do. And on the final point, and on the final point about letting the people in Glossop stay in Glossop, and uh, I'm not sure I do agree that we all need to double the beds in the future. Thames Island Glossop has invested a huge amount of money in our social prescribing and how we are supporting people at home. That is what our thrust is. We want people to stay in their own homes and supported by their own families as far as possible. So actually, how we do that in social prescribing in Glossop is the first one to go live. It's where we've put the majority of our investment so far. It is the Bureau are doing the most monumental job in the turning around stuff and how they've engaged with the whole of the voluntary sector. And we are, I'm so, I can't tell you how impressed I am. It's been Greater Manchester Health and Social Care Partnership have been out to look at it. They want to mirror it across the whole of GM. And absolutely, that's where we've put our major investment from the Greater Manchester Trans uh, Transformation Funds is into the social prescribing in Glossop. And that's, you know, that's a fact. So I, don't th I hope if that all works properly, we won't need to double the beds. But I do fully accept that there is this issue about letting the people in Glossop stay in Glossop. Yeah. And that was one of the reasons why we put up an option free. And that is something that we could potentially consider again. <laughs> The second person that spoke about the statistics, and I'm sure they know the, the, the Lansdowne license statistics, um, 
But, you know, it's the same statistic. We're just looking at that on, in different ways. I think you're absolutely right. The statistics are that Glossop is not a fair site for the provision of half the beds. That's, that's, you're quite right. It's unchangeable, that part. It's not the right site. And actually, if you say we need a shire here, our share of beds in Glossop is about seven. And that's what it works out as. We know we've got nationally the right number in Thameside and Glossop by external sources. We know population-wise Glossop is our smallest of the five neighbourhoods, and therefore we would have seven beds. So does that mean we need a shire hill? If you said that, so if we said need, then that need would be in our other neighbourhoods as well. They would all need that. I, I don't think they all need that. Yeah. Seven beds, 24 hour care in, in a big unit. So if we looked on it the other way around, and this was something that was raised at the IP Council meeting and said, so our seven beds credibly, we could say, instead of them being housed in, you know, what was a long stay community placement hospital, and that was changed from, that's why it was changed from workhouse into the hospital in the days when you were there for six months or forever. <coughs> that's not the same as an enablement bed for six weeks or so. We said we'd do something else with our seven beds, which is the share for Glossop. We could then say, well, that's a variation of three, version, sorry, option three, where we could, um, we could step up the provision in our care homes. And then, hand in heart, I must ask you, if we said that, could we really say that each of our care homes could match the same skills and input of a dedicated team whose job it is to re-enable people 24 hours a day? And at that point, I think it becomes a less credible argument. Well, and the last thing, I, I absolutely, frustration with the emptiness of the Glossop Primary Care Centre is shared. It will not for always stay a white elephant. It will end a grey elephant being used fully. Please be patient, I will come to you. It depends on the mic. Right, I'm going to ask for the gentleman with the red tie and then the lady with the hand up there with the grey and white checks and the gentleman right at the back with the spectacles on. Thank you. Am I on this? My name is Cheryl Riley and I've lived in Crossford for many, many years. And I love Park Crescent, opposite was Hospital. And we lost that, didn't we? Yes. And this is deja vu, because about 15 years ago, I think, we were trying to close Shire Hill again. You know, and it didn't happen, thank God. But what worries me is we speak about an aging population. So people are not going to stay younger in Gloucester, they're going to get older, so you will need more beds yeah. to centralise them in Tameside, you know, in the National Line. How, in, in this aging population, is it not going to be inconvenient for those people to try and get to visit? Yes. We're not going to think of the patients here, because the families have to visit them. Mm. We speak about the uh, traffic, it's horrendous. And you know, it will put a lot of pressure on the people of Glossop to go all the way down to Tameside. I, I really don't think it's right. It seems to me, and I've been listening intently, and hey, forgive me for saying this, but I think the decision has already been made. Yes. 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 I can walk at home now, what's Coronation Street? You know, because it's not really shown us a great deal of respect, is it? But it's been made very clear today, our preferred option. Yeah. Well, I hope you really think about that and show the people of Gossip a little respect.
Um, as you can probably gather, I'm actually an ex-patient of Shire Hill. I was there for eight weeks last year. My name is Lorraine Johnson. Um, just to say about the, um, the way the modern facilities have to provide ensuite. I had an ensuite room in Tameside. It was of no use to me at all because I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't actually um, be showered because I still had open rooms. Um, and actually the room would have been quite small for me to get around in even with men to start helping me. So it wouldn't have done me any good. I had great, great care at Shire Hill. So many different facilities there that helped me and rehabilitated me. I have a question about the, um, those readmitted to hospital. You've got 27% were readmitted from Shire Hill. I'd be interested to know how many were readmitted, what percentage were readmitted from um, the Stanford unit. And just one other thing on the statistic, 40% of 847 comes to something like 330 patients. That is 10% of the population of Glossop. You keep talking about Glossop and Tameside being 250,000. There are 33,000 plus people in Glossop and 10% of them have experienced a view of Shire Hill. Thank you. My name is Mark Gray and I work for Ruth George, the MP for High Peak. Um, she sends her apologies. She had to stay in the House of Commons tonight to uh, take part in the Brexit debate, um, which is obviously of uh, significance. Most of, the, most of the things she wanted to ask about have been covered, but there is one um, short-term difficulty, potentially, for, for the uh, uh, preferred option. Um, stunned that... Uh, um, no one's looking forward to 2030, it's only 13 years away. Um, but in the short term, we're due an announcement for the uh, long-awaited Mottram Bypass. <laughs> <laughs> that, that announcement may well come uh, this week or next. Um, there will be a significant uh, period of construction which will make transport between Glossop um, and Greater right Manchester even more difficult than it is now. And if this proposal is for the short term, which is what I'm hearing, um, it will severely disrupt visiting and access. Navy officer. Today, at Prime Minister's question time, the Prime Minister assured members and the public that health trusts like yours, wait, listen up, <laughs> are expected to act on what the local public want. And that was in the House of Commons today. Last week, we had 4,670 plus petitions handed to Parliament to demand that Shire Hill is kept open. Three local members of Parliament, two from Tameside and one from the High Peak, are all supporting keeping Shire Hill open. We have the High Peak Borough Council rejecting your factually incorrect argument for closing Shire Hill Hospital. After listening to your presentation, which was nothing to do with patient care, but more for justifying the existence of two 
more medical expensive quangles. <laughs> if, if you lot bother to look on the internet at the National Health Service Choices website, you will see that the most important people, the patients, give Shire Hill a top rating of five stars. Yes. Well, Tameside Hospital, on the same site, only received a grudgingly 3.5 stars. <laughs> However, <laughs> Tameside has been named as the top UK hospital where you can expect to die. <laughs> According to the eminent hospitality expert, Brian Jarman. I know I'd like to get out of Tameside and to Shire Hill as soon as I, I could if it were there. Throughout your presentation, all you seem to be pushing the incorrect statement that Shire Hill Hospital is an intermediate chair centre, when by your own admission you know that they are they're caring for patients who are not anywhere near to going home. I want you to state how we, the people of Glossendale, can influence your stupid decision to close Shire Hill Hospital when there are two senior Tameside Council officers, three Tameside councillors on the newly installed single commissioning board, and there's no representatives from Glossop Hill, High Creek Borough Council, or Derbyshire County Council to put the case against a seemingly done and dusted decision. <coughs> this question this question is very important because the majority of unelected <laughs> single commissioning board members who will make this decision to close Shire Hill Hospital have been noticeably absent from these meetings and from even visiting Shire Hill Hospital to see for themselves. Indeed, the members of the CCG were instructed not to answer a personal invite to attend these meetings. This was confirmed by the last chair of the meeting that was held at Bradbury House. Thank you. as concise as possible to allow all the members of the audience to, to ask a question. There were a number of questions there about ageing population, uh, traffic, uh, 33,000 hospital residents, um, and on suite facilities at Tameside. We've got the, the question from Ivan there, uh, and another question on transport again. I'm looking at the first question around, or one of uh, Mr. Bell's comments about um, the sepsis and the deaths in Tameside. Um, I don't think I've ever been angrier than when I saw those headlines in the Daily Mail. But that data was based on four years ago data. That is why Tameside Hospital went into special measures. Was it? Every single member of staff in that hospital, and I include those who work in Shire now, every single member of staff who has worked and has done absolutely nothing but give their all for the last three and a half years to turn that organisation around. It is now good. It is, in my opinion, one of the best hospitals we have in Greater Manchester. And I'm taking this question because I'm not sure that Carol would actually be able to answer this. And I think it's really disingenuous to use data that it is four years out of date when absolutely we are above the average. We have less now than 
any other area, and we are benchmarked as best for all of our standards. And I actually think we should be really quite proud of what the hospital has done, and also what uh, all of our staff have contributed to. So I just wanted to get that on the record. is that, and you're not going to like this one either, but I absolutely fundamentally believe that what makes care good is what our staff are. Our staff are great. It's not about the bricks and mortar, and I understand all of the things about uh, where buildings and everything are located. But absolutely what is important is how the staff care for people, how they're trained, how they're supported, how they work together, and all of that will still be in place in this government unit. Only if the staff would move, yeah, absolutely only if the staff would move. We can't have conversations with the staff yet because we haven't been able to, we haven't made a decision. That's what we're going through this process. Only once, right, so say if option three was chosen instead of option two, only then would we be able to have a discussion with staff about where they all went next and how that all worked. We've absolutely been clear that we have no intention of making anybody redundant. We are not envisaging any changes to the staffing services. Should Absolutely not. The staff should be factored into the cost units. Because if the staff aren't going to move, then you're going to have to pay you the cost units. We will have to have those conversations with staff. So we you need to No, what I'm saying is what I'm saying is that our first priority is understand what our public want. And that's why we have a public consultation. No. Right now, we can have this conversation between the two of us, or you can just hang on a second and let me finish what I'm going to say and then we'll move on to this half of the room. Okay, so I'm very aware that there are a number of staff in this audience as well, quite rightly. Most of you probably live live here as well. So, uh, just the other thing about, um, yeah, so I think I've addressed the sepsis. Um, yeah, my understanding is that the not to bypass decision is like, is imminent, um, and about the road, and I, I'm aware of that. We haven't been able to plan any of that into this work. I hate to say it, but I, I, you know, I've only been working in this area for the last two and a half years. My understanding is that the Moxham bypass has been discussed for considerably longer than that and that you've been let down on a number of occasions beforehand about what this is. So we did not factor that or the level of uh, disruption that there may be and I fully take that point. Um, and uh, should we know more in the next couple of weeks and what the planning is for that, then obviously we will need to think about that. Um, should we ever come to a decision and should we need to start implementing things. Um, and one more thing, it's been asked twice and I don't think we've actually answered it. In terms of the 27% who were admitted from Shire Hill, in terms of the Stanford unit, it's 16%. So there is a, there is a difference. Um, so there is sort of the Stanford unit, but that is, as you know, one of the things, sorry, I'm not sure that we picked this up either, is that patients aren't admitted to intermediate care beds based on their postcode. They're admitted due to the needs and the, the needs that they have, the uh, staff um, and the facilities that we can to offer for them. So it could be that there are, in some terms, that there are sick patients in one more than the other, but we don't admit on terms of postcode. That's not what the NHS does. We base all of our clinical decisions on where we believe the best outcomes are. So I don't know whether or not. Alan, uh, Karen, do you want to come in or anything or do you think I've covered it? Just briefly about the reaction rates. I think it's easier because... Uh, Sorry? Use your microphone, please. Uh, is that better? Okay, so the Stanford unit is right opposite the hospital. It is a separate facility, but we're able to access uh, access medical support if required. We have got an enhanced GP service in there 24-7. Uh, However, if they do need specialist input, they can receive that input. Rather than the patient having to be transferred back to the hospital, only if they really need, and they're very acute, will they be transferred back. But if they need that additional expertise, that support, we can facilitate that because it's on site. And that's why the readmission rate is reduced. Even 16% is actually inflated because, because of the way we capture the data. Those that come uh, transfer into uh, Tayside just for diagnostics and go back 
to the Stamford building, then they're counting in those statistics as well. So it is even inflated, but it's a lot better than the emission rates in, in terms of Shine Hill. So I just wanted to clarify that. <laughs> We kind of ask again and we keep the questions nice and concise and, and have respect for the, for the speakers as well. Uh, I'd like to go to the lady with the black jumper with the hand up now, please. On the thing behind you there, the screen, it's a March 2015 to May 2017. Well, in fact, in March 2015, it was a Darton. It was Darton now. Them. So why are they in our figures? Just change the name. It was out of house was quite a private little um, care home. Uh, that is since we took it over. Well, it's all shut down in that period, but yeah. that's since we've taken it over. It was shut down from November 2015. That is from our computer system. So actually, it's so. It must be my <laughs> <laughs> Sure, we, Why don't good. you listen to us instead of voting rubbish? No, I'm not the listening. statistics, I'm sorry. the computers are wrong. Yes. The computers okay. are wrong. So, has just we know what we're like, you yes. don't. Okay, but it was <coughs> All I'm saying is, these figures relate to when we have taken over. When, when we took over dogs and we changed the name to Stanford. But it's when all these statistics are since we took that building over. Yeah. <coughs> I'd just like to say the reason I put my hand up early and the reason I'm shaking is because I've got Parkinson's. So I'm not particularly angry or anything like that. But I tried to sleep when I was, my medication was working and I've had to wait uh, a considerable length of time and now it's even less well. I'd like to also say that I've spent 20 years teaching my students about dreadful ways to consult the public about issues and this is the worst I've ever seen. I've ever exactly. personally been involved in. I do not doubt that every one of the three of you on this panel cares deeply about the health, health, health service, but the way you've set up this meeting, you haven't recognised that you're the people with power. You've set up a meeting where people are told they have to make very, very quick questions and then, and then move on. You know, there's, there's no flow of debate because I, I, I also wanted to respond to something Dr. Dr. Alton said right at the beginning. We couldn't do that because you set it up in a very fragmented, undemocratic, in undemocratic way and put yourselves under pressure you didn't need to do. You should learn from other people that are from public consultations in a much more creative way, in a much less confrontational way, than sitting yourselves at the front, making yourselves the experts and putting us in the audience in opposition to you. Terrible. Absolutely terrible. Absolutely. And I'm sure that you've all got, you're really committed to, to the health, health service, but you're hospital administrators, and you're talking about, it seems to me, extending your hospital and making it bigger by having a, a little bit extra on the, on the edge of it. All the statistics that I have read about community care, in, it's people going back to their own communities have better health results, and that takes money in, in, in the end. And you talked, I, I, absolutely, I'm really, I'm really glad that there are going to be resources to, to help people stay in their homes. But actually, if the technology is there to help someone have a drip in their home, to help someone have, 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 have really sophisticated technological care in their home, how would you go to try here? In my front room. It seems to me you stipulate the community on a building in, 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 in Ashton. It doesn't make it community, it doesn't make it somewhere where we feel at home. It doesn't make it somewhere where our family can visit without having to, 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 to travel an, an, an hour and a half. Surely that's the reason why there are better outcomes, because people feel psychologically better. And it seems to me, yes, the, and, and the, that's why I was going back to all this point. If you, if, you look at, if you look at the data about heart, heart surgery, if you look at the data about uh, brain surgery, yes, you need centres of excellence, places to go, the Christie Hospital for cancer, you all want to go anywhere, anywhere better, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people transitioning from hospital to home, and surely that should be as close to home as possible, and not yeah. an hour and a half's ride. Away. Paul Broadus, local health campaigner from Tainside. <laughs>
Right, I've been to all these meetings, and what I've witnessed is a sham. A few points of public interest. <coughs> At uh, the last meeting in Jordan, now I've got to say this, at the last meeting in Jordan, I actually thanked the... Uh, unimpartial chair for all her input to the meeting and championing option two. Now that was the impartial chair to that meeting. <laughs> that. Now you've got a CCG here who state that patient care is a paramount, yet they use a concept of care provision which was first discussed in 2012 which will further isolate the expanding Glossopdale community and is found to be flawed on so many levels. Then you've got the hospital. Now we've just had high rate follow-back from the sepsis thing. Now I've got data from the facility of London Medical Hospital stating about the increase in death rates at Thames High Hospital. And I could go on for hours about what's going on, but here's a quick one for you. After serious patient care, Chief Executive Karen James stated after patient care was brought to her attention, disgusting patient care, that they've just appointed a new interim chief nurse who will look after the basic principles and standards of care four years after the heel and climate. And I won't go any further than that where the hospital is concerned because I could go on for hours. But well, then you've got Tameside Council, whose CEO is also a countable officer of the CCG. So throughout this process, I think the community of both Tameside and Glossop have just been given lip service and in fact, you have all experienced a call sortation. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Jean Warmby. I'm a local resident. Um, I'm here as a local resident, but I also am on High Peeper Council and Derbyshire County Council and the Cabinet Member for Adult Care. I've got to agree with a lot of things that Sir John said. Um, if option two goes ahead, before anything can be done, we've got to have things put in place. I don't know what option is going to be chosen, it's a consultation. <laughs> but, their facilities aren't in place at the moment. And I just urge you that if that is chosen, you need to have discussions with Derbyshire County Council and we need to work in partnership if that's going to happen. Because at this moment in time, things are not in place. Okay, so we've got three questions in there. One about consultation with the Dutch County Council, one about um, the consultation itself on patient care at Thameside, um, and about care posts to home at Shire Hill. its whole future was in the balance. It was a district general hospital and really all it did, okay, it did outpatients as well, but it was an acute bed-based, really old-fashioned model. And to say now that this is the same is really just flying in the face of the transformation. This is now CQC rated as good. Two steps on, three steps on from here. Garbage. This has got the question national audits for being first in a few things and is absolutely 
to be sent forward to deliver and pay out in the community. So, I mean, to, to say that it's back where it was then, I think, is pretty good, actually. Yeah, right. It's not. The whole ethos of having an integrated care, FT, is to work on a non-acute, fair-based model. It's all about looking after people in the community and all of our neighbourhoods, what it is a neighbourhood, we have five neighbourhoods, we want to apply that fairly across all of them. Um, the Mottram bypass is potentially a big thing. I, I don't know. Um, I've got a feeling that should it get to go ahead, should there be building works, I'm kind of not thinking it will start the next day. If it did, though, we come back to the statistical <coughs> question, what are we actually saying? I think the room was saying the access becomes virtually impossible, apart from 999 ambulances. So if that were to happen, how does that strengthen the argument of having 32 beds currently in Chicago used mostly by residents that can't get here? Um, okay, I just want to come back on a couple of points. Um, uh, one of the councillors from Derbyshire and High Peak, um, absolutely, I think we would say that the services are still relatively embryonic and growing in the Gloucester area, and I think that absolutely is a very valid point to make sure that should anything, we would have to put other things in place should there be that decision or before any changes happen. Um, and the second thing to say is around the consultation. Um, I've done a number of these over the last sort of 28 years of working in the health service and it's, I, I agree with you, I don't think this is the best way to um, set up meetings. However, we do have, we've put four public meetings of which this is one. We've also been to um, scrutiny committees, health and wellbeing boards, voluntary sector communities, carers organisations, patient neighbourhood groups. Uh, we've been to uh, all, for example, the Tameside Town, so that's nine of them. We've been to all of those communities where we have had a much better dialogue. Um, if there is a way of structuring the actual core public meetings, in a better way, I would be delighted to hear about it. It's very well documented. You okay, well, we use the Consultation Institute, who are the people who we've gone through and we've worked with to make sure that we get everything. They were the same people who looked at the Healthier Together plans and a number of other plans. I suggest start by looking at world world cafe models where people come together, sit together, talk together. Okay. And that means um, everybody would have a well, voice set, not just, just those who got just, chosen. We've just started today on the urgent care one. So if if it'd be alright, I'd like to pick that up outside of this arena, perhaps, and perhaps think about how we can do it in a different way. This one, beyond the 15th yeah. of November, have some more meaningful discussion, which everyone can take part in. Yeah. Not everybody is comfortable putting their hands up and speaking no, in a big room. No, I understand that, but I think what we have done is we've tried to communicate in a number of different types of fora. So we can debate that, but, um, but I do your, take the point this isn't But this with isn't respect ideal. to your committee people, and I mean that in a good way, I mean, I do it stop, as well. Stop you there, only because I'm conscious that we'll lose okay. people at the back of the room who won't be able to hear us. Yeah. But hold on. <coughs> Hi, um, I'm here. I'm not representing anyone but myself. Um, I just wanted to ask a question regarding the statistics. So um, everything in the consultation document that was provided to us today uh, seems to be skewed in favour of option two. Mm -hmm. Now, earlier on you said that um, everything that you are trying to do is for what the patient wants. Now, out of those 847 patients, and in particular those 84% that live outside of, sorry, within five miles of the Stanford Union, how many of those actually would have preferred to go to Shy Hill and the Stanford unit? And also, in the documentation, where is the information regarding the fact that in November 2015, there was an inspection at Darnton House, as it was then, uh, which ended up in Darnton House being put in special measures. That is, during the period that you are actually quoting there on your patient data.
will make it. who were in Shy Hill this year. And A, I want to say that the, what I got, the, <coughs> the mercy that I got there was immaculate. And when you go in there, you are in between. You don't need um, your own little loo, because you're getting to walk, you're starting to walk, so it's good to walk to the toilet and come back again. So I think that is, is totally out of the window. But also, I think, I feel sorry for the young lady that was on first, because she was saying about um, She'd taken a, an app or something like that to get to know how long it takes to get from Gloucester to there. Now these apps were always long behind the actual. So they would be by actual design late. And yet you're looking at the amount of people who are going to need it and that should be looking forward. So really, you can't put the two together. And when you do consider what's going to come off in between, i.e. if we ever get it, and I've been waiting for 40 years for this wonderful bypass, if that comes up, you have no chance of getting there. So I think Shire Hill should stay and they should get a, a medal for being there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> David Swanston, I'm the Russell President. I don't know where to start because this whole exercise has a nice wonderland feel about it. It's not consultation, it's justification. Yeah. We uh, uh, had a range of truths and half-truths uh, amongst the statistics. The point I made at the last uh, meeting still hasn't been addressed in your latest slide. The travel time on public transport. I don't care how long it takes to get from Drysdale to uh, the Stanford unit. A more meaningful statistic, if 45 minutes is your, your benchmark, your metric, do you know what proportion of people from Gossip could get to the Stanford unit in 45 minutes on public transport? If you don't, I suggest it's probably zero. A number of your other items would just be misleading, if not in actually inaccurate. Uh, now, Take the comment you just made about the consultation process. I'm a member of the PPG and my GP practice. I also sit on the Gossip neighbourhood. We haven't been consulted, neither the PPG nor the neighbourhood. It's come up. We've raised opinions, they've gone forwards, we've had no feedback from them. Not even an answer, not even a, a response. We are, we've come here. As I say, not in a, a basic of consultation, which is normally the process not of justifying a decision after it's been taken, and formally it might be December, but basically the decision has been made. You've come to justify a decision you've already got, and to tell us why we are wrong. The, I say, I'm quite angry, I'm a bit disjointed. Uh, Yesterday, for the first time, I saw a report 
Uh, I think of your name on this. Sorry, Karen, your name on it. Uh, about, uh, it struck me as almost insultingly bribing and cynical that, well, if we forgo Sally Hill, we might get more services at George Street. Yeah. <laughs> that was the way it came across. Yeah. <coughs> George Street has been there for long enough that if you wanted to put services in there, you'd have put them in there. Yeah. There wasn't even a, a promise of, we are going to do this to George Street, and that justifies the removal of the bed in Shire Hill. It struck me just totally and utterly cynical. If you want to increase the use of it, make the GP access a lot more accessible. Uh, the only way to get point of development is through your own GP. Yeah. Yeah. Which is not what you use on a Saturday, is it? The place is there on a Saturday, the doctors are there on a Saturday, the patients aren't, because you're not allowing them access to it. You've got to have found on Friday if you knew you were going to be doing it on a Saturday. Not very useful. <laughs> I think I'll run out of things to say. But yeah, your justifying decision you've taken, you've not come uh, with a range of proposals, hear what the people say, go back and make the decision. And I'd like, I'd like to know how you are going to make a decision, given that you seem already to have made one. Yes, it can be formally done in December, but I suspect that's not even an open mind, and it's you to, to, to contradict that. Kind of, we've got a question about George Street and we've got transport again. <coughs> okay, um, in terms of George Street, I, I think it's a I certainly don't think I've written anything about George Street. Pardon? It's probably in the last of Chronicles. Okay, well, I certainly haven't approached me for any quotes. Okay, so I've been quoted, but certainly I haven't said anything. However, we will be actually moving uh, services into the primary care centre. We're going to be moving community services, physio, OT services. So that can happen tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, they do know, they've been down, but absolutely. So this is not part of this consultation process. This is what we're doing for all the neighbourhoods. Okay, so it's the same in all five neighbourhoods. What we're trying to do is what I've previously articulated, is move services together. They can be co-located, it improves communication, it's less fragmentation. So it's happening in every neighbourhood. So it's already happened in the other four. I've actually delayed it in Gossip because I thought if I do do that now, you'll be saying we're already made a decision about Shy Hill, although these are community services that are separate to Shy Hill consultation. So yes, I can do those services tomorrow. In terms of um, the Darton building, uh, basically the, the Darton building was uh, a nursing home. It was built uh, by a private investor. They did run into CQC issues. Therefore, at that point, we said we would take it over. That wasn't until 2006. No, we are absolutely, I know when we've taken it over. So we've registered with CQC, and so we provide services now, and we've already got intermediate care services on two floors within that unit. So and then take it on two floors or one floor. So two floors, so I have you know two floors are already there providing intermediate care services. So how many six beds? And then on three two floors on floor. one. There's thirty two beds on each floor. <coughs> and when we say in terms of you yeah, know on sleep facilities, because I just want to pick up on that, yes there are on sleep facilities, but there are other facilities there which will allow patients to become more independent and aid their rehabilitation requirements. Karen, so are there stickers on two floors or one floor? Two floors. I asked you on the last consultation, was them figures on one floor or two floors? So they came at different times. Okay, so we tried to... Oh, so we have got to be 64 beds then. Yes, so so no, 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 no. Please listen, please listen. The first floor was open at earlier than the second floor. We just recently transferred services from Grange View into the second floor. Okay, so there, there's different time scales there. So your figures don't add up. It's still not the perspective, I don't care what the perspective is. It's still waiting for it to be the perspective. Um, it's a point to make. Yeah. Nobody's listening. 
Okay, so it's based on 64 beds, then figures when Shia Rail referred to four beds. Yeah. 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 Okay, so each floor has 32 beds. So each floor has got three floors. Each has got 32 beds. Two floors are currently open. They open at different periods in time, but we've got two floors open. We still have the ground floor that we have not filled at this point in time. So we got So we got in total, in total, we have 96 beds at the start. The current position up there is wrong. Is incorrect. Yeah. That's the point that he's making. There's 64 beds at Stamford. The current position is wrong. Ryan's got the figures wrong. Go on the side. And 36 beds at Under the current provision. Yes. Wrong. Wrong. This document is wrong. Okay, so the floor is like that. Okay, the top floor is discharge from the sets. Okay, so patients are transferred to discharge to assess on the top floor. The second floor is intermediate repair beds. Is that helpful? Is that helpful? No, because now we're not going to Okay, each floor, there are three floors. Each floor has 32 bed spaces. So spaces for physical beds. The top floor is usually discharged to assess. So people are being discharged, assessed for social care packages or something, and then being moved home. So it should stay standard, the second floor, it's got 64 beds then. The middle floor, so the middle floor is used as intermediate care, and that is 32 beds. The ground floor currently has no beds in it. It is empty at the moment. Now, what the other thing is, for those beds on the first floor and the second floor, we use them interchangeably. Sometimes there might be more than 32 patients who need intermediate care based on the same side of the site, and sometimes there might be less. And what we do is we manage our bed base flexibly. We have a really highly experienced, very competent group of staff, and they manage those beds flexibly. There is room for the Shire Hill bed to move into the Stamford unit on the ground floor and enable that further flexibility. Okay, so that's, that's, so that's the last one. So I can't listen and take everybody and everything. Okay, so there was one more thing that I wanted to come back on, which was about an open mind and about somebody said about not disrespecting the uh, residents of Glossop. We've been very clear that we have a preferred option. I've gone out to consultations before and um, without stressing a preferred option, and in fact the urgent care arm doesn't have a preferred option, and that's because it doesn't have. This one, we do have a preferred option, but it does not mean that the decision has been made. And I know you're all going to boo and hiss about that, and I get that. However, that's why we're here and we've got this 12-week consultation period to listen to all of these views about it. We are listening. If there was a significant impact on the equality impact or the, you know, the clinical arguments or the volume of patient uh, responses, all of that is taken into consideration. And that's why we have a strategic commissioning board, which I fully accept there are gaps in terms of um, high peak current Borough Council and Derbyshire, and we learned that through this very process, and we are now working with those organisations to address that and to make sure that that isn't the case, because I can accept absolutely that that isn't the right way to, in order to make sure that gossip's voice is heard. I get that, and we're going to change that, and that's something that we've learned through this. Um, I'm also learning this evening that our consultation process could be better. 
And I'm all up for that as well. I'm really up for that. But we have got the third option, but it does not mean we are not listening to you. I'm going to take you, sir, because you're right in my eye line. Come on, man. Have you already spoken? Yeah, Should right. we pop a right? Okay, I'm not going to. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> There's a few questions down this side of the room. My name's Anthony Brocklebank, and we're a local resident. Um, slightly different type, we've talked about readmission from intermediate care. Um, that happens when there are plenty of nurses and people to assess that someone's deteriorating and they go back into the hospital. But there's another area and that is readmission from home. Yeah. And there doesn't seem to be any discussion of that. Perhaps that falls into a different category altogether. But it used to be the case that before patients were discharged, they had to be cleared by the doctor, the ward sister, and the occupational therapist. And I think in addition, there was some assessment as to what was available at home. Um, this now seems to be under pressure. Is it the case that hospitals have appointed some mysterious figure called a ward ranger whose role it is to actually get people out of the hospital. Because I've been given that impression. I had a cousin who was discharged twice to an empty home and had to be readmitted twice, and then he died. Now, uh, it, this has happened at several hospitals. So is it a new, a new role in the hospital service? That's my question. Lady with the glasses on there and the purple top. Lady with the glasses. Have their hands up really. This lady with the glasses. Thank you very much. It's very good to hear from you. Thank you. Katie. Name is Bond. I think you can hear me. I am on a PPG in town. <coughs> We're newcomers. I've only been here 16 years, so we don't have the same objectives. The one thing I haven't heard at all from the platform is anything about carers. Now, carers, we have a gentleman in our church who at the moment is having to tra travel into Manchester. And the other day we took him to the station and he just said, I am tired. Now, the very thought for carers or people, loved ones, and there are a lot of old people, we're getting that way very quickly, also find the journey to Thameside extremely hazardous. You can't do it in 20 minutes or 40 minutes. If you have to go by bus, I believe at least one change is needed. <laughs> and also, a lot of people haven't got the money to go and spend on <coughs> parking, especially if they're loved ones and you want to see them a couple of times a day, which is not unusual. And I would like an answer as to how you, as a board, would satisfy that need if Shire Hill, which does a marvellous service from what we can say to the local population, if they have to pay all that money, how are you going to overcome the problems it is going to create for the carers and the loved ones? to a friend and this is anecdotal, I'm sorry, but she told me her father's experience in the Stanford unit wasn't very good at all and listening to what's going on tonight, it sounds like we're much better off keeping Shia Hill. Yeah, 
Hi, uh, my name is Paul Bell, I'm a local resident. Um, everything we've heard tonight seems to be, as Jennifer said, a justification for option for actually closing Shire Hill. Yep. If you do close Shire Hill, are you aware that it's actually given in, per in perpetuity to the people of Glossop, yes. the land? Yeah. And I know for some reason it's with the National Health Properties. But if you're going to fill the bottom half of uh, Stamford House with Shire Hill beds and you're going to send NHS properties that are going to sell off Stamford, uh, sell off Shire Hill, what's going to happen to that money? Or are, are, can you actually say it was given to people who have lost an in perpetuity? Can it stay with the people who have lost it? Can something be done with it? Or can you not sell it? I don't, to, to, because to me it seems ridiculous, it was given to the people of Glossop, it should stay for the people of Glossop. And it shouldn't be able to do that. mentioning is the grand scale of build, which I don't believe Tameside is, is able to do because we have a lot of land here that isn't available to people in Tameside because it's already built on. So I'm wondering if you're taking that into consideration with your 7% or 9% because you are building, you know, they are building a great deal of people, a great, great deal of building in you know, is that going to be taken into consideration? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, my name is Clive Rimmer. I'm here as a resident, but also as a um, very concerned worker in the healthcare. healthcare. Um, I don't work at Shire here presently. Um, I just want to read you a direct quote from an email received this from somebody from the Department of Health with questions about this consultation on what's happening at Shire Hill. And in the email, they actually state, the government pledged that all service changes should be led by clinicians and patients, not be driven by the, from the top down. The Department of Health outlined strengthened criteria that decisions on NHS service changes are expected to meet. They must have support from GP commissioners, be based on sound clinical evidence, demonstrate strengthened public and patient engagement, and consider patient choice. I just want to kind of pick out three elements of that that I actually think we're going to ask them today, that's fine. That's just you, and you need to be aware of. Um, it's just interesting to hear about the sound clinical evidence to meet the services. That has never been demonstrated. You have got a staff up at Shire Hill of nurses who have advanced clinical skills who actually could run to Shire Hill as a drop in A and E, mini A and E, like George Patrick, like the George Street was supposed to be when it was originally built. You've got a lot of experience up there that is not being used. The experience that you just mentioned at Stanford have got these fantastic nurses that do all this death and enhanced care. You can do that at Shire Hill. You don't need GPs, you don't need doctors, you've got enough nurses up there that can still to do nurse life provision. The consideration of the patient choice. For intermediate care, that's gone from three to one in this area. Grange View, which was in Hyde, I believe, was shut down in the spring yep. without any consultation. It was just shut down and the staff were just given their marching orders. <coughs> and now we've got Tameside or Shire Hill and what you want to do with your preferred option that's seemed a bit smooth now with all the numbers is to actually take away that patient choice as well. So our choice will be Tameside, Tameside or Tameside. Mm -hmm. yeah. The thing is this demonstration of public and patient engagement the first meeting at the Crosser was oversubscribed at one minute past six and people were turned away. You could have had more people in that room had you moved the chair and allowed people to stand. The meetings at Duckingfield and Doylesburg, a handful of public turned up. 
does that not actually say they don't really care what happens because it's not going to directly affect the local population? So what is it matter to us whether the, this, whether the people in the rural gossip can come and meet our urban services? You've had to put on a second public meeting here tonight, and I think you can agree with the numbers present and giving you the answer to your public consultation that option that option one to keep Shire Hill open has got overwhelming local support. Yeah. You can develop services here at Shire Hill to meet the increasing demands of an increasing population with an increasing number of over sixes who will need intermediate care support as well as other services close to home. And if uh, the previous meeting was uh, something said about we couldn't do a model like that. Well, you could follow the model, such as the power model for cancer services that was brought in in 1995 that brought specialist services out to the local hospitals which meant people did not have to travel all the way into city centres to have chemotherapy. And you can see now, actually in this area, you've got the Christie's at Oldham doing the radiotherapy, therapy, but you've got Christie's at High Peak that give chemotherapy to patients in one of the new mills, GP surgeries, which means that they can go, they can go and have their chemotherapy and carry on with their everyday work, and people do not have to take time off sick, time off an annual leave, in order to take their ones to have treatments locally. And I think that shutting up Shire Hill, you are missing a massive, massive opportunity of being able to replicate services that mean that people in the gossip area, people in a rural area, are getting the same services as people in a town area. And there is evidence of free spaces and well-being. And Capaldi et al. in 2014 said, wellness and health is the, the, being able to go to three spaces is as high an indicator as income and education for the health of people. You talked right at the beginning about wanting to have healthy well-being for the people of Rosser. Shut down Pope Shire Hill and you've missed a huge opportunity to make a massive difference to loads of people. Well is that in your, if you're in an acute hospital setting, healthcare acquired infections are high. The number of the, the group of people who need rehabilitation or intermediate care are vulnerable to the infections. I'm really concerned about the increased risk of infection of people being treated on the hospital site with people in and out from the acute, se acute sector. That's a real risk to patients. And I was like to ask, there was, my experience in the last 18 years here is that the standardised mortality rate has been very high for Tameside. Still is. I, I don't, I'd like to know what it is now. If it's low, great, but you cannot expect local residents to trust the hospital immediately. If we might do changes, it's going to take us a long time to believe that our elderly relatives are not going to die because of poor care, because we've experienced it too often. So I must let the panel respond to those most valid questions. The questions cover carers, uh, the land and the perpetuity, um, out of hospital, patient choice and, and infection and mortality. Okay, so I'll give you a bit of discharge mortality. procedures. So, uh, yeah, discharge procedures. Okay, so the mortality rates are better than the average, national average. Okay, so over the last four years, I can assure you it's all there out um, and published. They're better than the national average, okay, in terms of mortality. So that has made a seed change over the last four years. So that's fact, it's out there for you to look at. In terms of uh, infection prevention, well, it is treated as a separate service unit. We don't have, although a consultant might go across occasionally, 
If it's stacked separately, there is not lots of people going between the acute and the intermediate care facility. It, it, it's, it's, treated what's, what's as, it's, it's treated as a separate unit. Uh, what is the other one I was going to do? I think there's a two. Discharge. Oh, discharge. Sorry. Yes. So we have a discharge to assess team. And obviously it is a decision from a medical perspective whether the patient is fit from a medical viewpoint as to whether the patient is able to be discharged. What we are finding, what we are doing is actually then assessing them for discharge in hospital is totally inappropriate. What we want to do is assess them in their own environment. So we discharge wrap uh, intensive services around them for 72 hours to ensure we can actually assess the patients in their own home and rather than in a very false environment like the hospital. And actually that's proved very, very beneficial from a family's perspective, patient perspective and our staff's perspective. So yes, we are trying to do different things to improve the discharge of patients. Can I ask, is there someone who has a specific role to track all the beds and see if there's any possibility to clear some of them? Yeah, so we, we know so we know every patient that is that is going through a discharge process. So even in the hospital, we know every patient that needs to be discharged and we know where they're up to in terms of the discharge pathway yes. So a couple of things I need to come back on. Um, so the lady over there the lady over there who talked about those four tests, um, that is what every consultation you're right is measured on. It's called they're called the four Lancy tests after the Secretary of State who introduced those and they are absolutely critical to all of that. And should you not fulfil those or any one of those, then obviously your consultation process is open to challenge, as I know uh, Mr. Webster referred to earlier. So we're, we're, we're well aware of that. But um, and I believe we're building a case around each of those. Um, however, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to debate that one, I suspect. The other thing is just to, to pick up about the building. Um, you're correct, the building is um, in the hands of or the management of NHS property services. It's nothing to do with um, our services. If, if that building were sold, we would not see any of the income from that. Um, it's not part of something that we have within our asset registers. It's, it's, it is part of NHS property services, which was a, um, you could call it quanga, you could call it an arm's length body, which was set up um, when we had the Health and Social Care Act and all NHS property, uh, community property was transferred into that. So we do not have a financial interest in any way, shape or form over what happens to that building should that decision ever be made. Um, I wasn't aware of that tenure uh, discussion you mentioned in terms of being given to the people because I would imagine NHS property services are, but if they're not, I'll certainly be mentioning, making sure that that is kept across because it's a really valid, it's a really valid point. Um, I think probably as we have run over in time, and I'm, I know you've still got some hands up, um, is that, you know, I know these things aren't satisfactory and I can only apologise for the, um, how these ones run and I don't want us to be up here um, in terms of thinking that we're either more powerful or that we know it all. Um, that's not the way that we try to do these things. That's why we use a multitude of different types of fora to hear voices. This one is something that we, we want to do, we need to do in terms of standing up. We are the responsible people. Alan is the, the chair and the GP lead. Uh, Karen is a nursing background again, but also the chief executive of the trust. And myself, as we do need to stand up in these sort of all these forums and take responsibility for these sort of decisions and the, and the consultation process. So um, I really wanted to say, I, I really wanted to say thank you for coming out on 1st of November, cold and everything. Um, I know it's not the most satisfactory thing, but I really do appreciate you coming. Are you prepared to look again at your option two? Having heard what you've heard tonight, are you prepared to go back and really consider what the people of Gloucester have been to you over these last two years? Yes. Or you yes, that is the point of having all of these sorts of meetings, all of the all of the different aspects 
of the evidence coming together into that. That's why we go through this. And yes, that's exactly the point of having a consultation. So yes, we're going to hear these voices. We're also going to hear the voices of the people who didn't turn up, as one of uh, one of the audience members here earlier said. There wasn't a huge amount of take up in the two Thameside public meetings, but we do also need to hear those voices as well. But we are hearing them all, and the way to get those, apart from these sort of meetings, is by filling in the consultation on those websites and ensuring that your voice is heard. And then, yes, we will be taking all of those aspects into consideration in our decision making process. May I ask something? I'm just going to hand over to Alan, who's going to do I'm going to ask up. one question, and this is. Why hasn't there been a um, one during the day? Because there's a lot of elderly people that can't get to the evening um, session like this because that they are unable because the buses stop after a certain time and they can't get into Glossop to come to these public meetings at night. I would like one to be done during the day, which I did do a letter for the Glossop Chronicle, which never got published. Because I was disgusted at the first meeting, it was announced when the actual paper were published that you were public, having a public meeting in Bradbury House, which I was disgusted by. Okay, I think that again is a valid point about how to do this. We have done, as I've said, we've engaged in numerous different hours, and many of those are in the day, but we obviously have a connection right into uh, those particular groups, and I'll take that on board. Well, you need, you, need, you need to do anyway. Can I just say, because they, they keep ignoring me, so I just want to say, the <laughs> beautiful description in here, in that yellow bit there, it says, Community bed settings. How can it be community settings when it's in Thameside, not in Glossop? for engaging so well with the panel. Um, we can cover as many questions as we possibly can, uh, given the time allowed. And I'd just like to thank the panel for fielding so many questions and just have uh, a uh, last word for the two panels. Okay, so I'm great, especially as everyone's uh, over to the door. But I, I do thank you for coming. I know people have said that it's a foregone conclusion or whatever. The reason I come, especially in the public meetings, is to actually hear what people say. And at every public meeting, I've been involved, people have said wise things, things for us to consider. Some of the absolutely practical things are there bariatric spaces in the Stanford unit, the door is wide enough, um, are the corridors suitable? Some of them are more, if you look at it again, can you do things in different ways? Could you up skill, up, sorry, up, up use, shy, help, etc. There are things that we will take a and consider. That's absolutely the point of why we have these meetings and it makes quite a to to hear what we do on. Okay.